What was it like dealing with civilians after having served? Well, that's an interesting question. Again, I was an army advisor and then I became an artist. When I signed out of the Army and resigned my commission, I came to New York to study at the Neighborhood Playhouse with Sanford Meisner, who was a great acting teacher. So the civilians I dealt with were largely other acting students. I worked as a waiter, I uh, was on the GI Bill, and one day uh, one of my customers was a producer of a soap opera. I didn't know that. He said, you're a hell of a waiter. And I said, I'm a better actor. <laughs> and he said, I'll bet you are. And he read me for a role, and uh, then I was offered a role, and I started making $400 a day. And uh, they wouldn't allow me to go to school anymore. Uh, so I didn't have any particular axe to grind with civilians. Um, I, I, um, I was quiet about my service. Uh, when I found other people who understood where I'd been, I would feel comfortable talking to them very candidly. But by and large, um, life went on and I was dedicated to becoming the best actor that I could be. So civilians, uh, they're assholes and they're good people, you know? How did you or what kind of effect does your military service have on your life now? Well, I think it is, I am male, I am black, and I am a veteran. And I think it is the most defining aspect of my life. That's not necessarily so for everyone. But because of my circumstances and experiences, I think it is the one thing that defines me more than anything else. What are some ways you cope, like if you ever have problems? Well, I meditate. I was diagnosed with PTSD in 1988. Uh, part of my therapy was writing down my memory, so I began to write essays. I don't write fiction. I think I suck at it. But uh, I write about the experiences and my interactions that I remember, and I have a, an easygoing voice so you would have the sense if you read my stuff or were sitting across the table having a beer. Uh, but I wasn't medicated until 10 years ago. And I had a difficult time for about seven or eight years in the 80s. Um, I was depressed. I uh, had very low self-esteem. I was suffering from what is called survivor guilt. A lot of people that I cared about didn't come home. And I did. And I shouldn't have, not medically speaking, there's no medical reason why I'm alive. But here I was, and I was having great success. I had Emmy nomination, commercials, soap operas, TV shows, movies, love, money. And I didn't feel that some part of me, this is not a conscious thinking, but underneath my subconscious was, who are you to have all these wonderful things? Who are you to be breathing in and out? when so many really good people that you know about and cared for didn't come home. So uh, post-traumatic stress disorder was very difficult and I have had to learn to live with it because it's a lifelong condition. I've had a lot of therapy. As I say, I meditate daily. Uh, I play golf. I try to find things that help me to relax and turn off my mind. I watch a lot of movies and uh, other work, theater, TV shows. I try to stay busy, but service is very important to me. When I was diagnosed in 88, I made a pledge to myself. I will, from this day forward, do everything I can to see that anyone who needs help can get it. So I have been dedicated to advocacy for treatment for our veterans who struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. Those are men and women. And it affects their relationships, it affects their ability to pay a mortgage or keep a job, it affects their interactions with their children and their neighbors and their relatives. It's a pretty encompassing condition. It's not that well understood. And the really sticky part about it is, it's not immediate. Bear in mind, I was in Vietnam bleeding to death in September 1969. My wheels didn't start to come off until 1980. I did very well for 11 years. We know there are tens of thousands of soldiers coming home right now with troubles, but there are even more of them who aren't aware of their troubles yet. 
and they are like kicking time bombs. It's not so much the danger to society. We don't tend to kill a bunch of people. We tend to kill ourselves. 22 veterans on average in their life every day. And so when people support systems break down and they have a trauma or a flashback, something triggers that fear, that anger, that rage, then everything stops and we go back to day one because our lives changed on those days in combat. We will never be the same. You can't forget some things. You shouldn't forget some things. And we need to have more therapists available to soldiers. Now, I was a board member for the Soldiers Project for the last four years. I resigned recently because I was burned out and we were starting to go in different directions. But the Soldiers Project provides confidential free care to veterans and to their loved ones, open-ended. Um, the problem for veterans is threefold. First of all, you have to get to the point where you can accept that you need help. Uh, we're in denial by and large, and our culture is to drive on, just suck it up and drive on, get it done, don't whine. And if you finally are fortunate enough to realize, I'm in trouble, I need to talk to somebody, I could, I could have a more fulfilling life, then you gotta, then you gotta accept the help. And it's not a lot of fun, it's, it's tough work, you're dealing with very, very fundamental issues that are terrifying and they frighten you and you break down and there's a lot of snot and there's a lot of tears. And then you got to find the help. And what was key about the Soldiers Project was that our care is confidential. Care is not confidential in the VA. And many of us have learned that if you have any other choices than to go to the VA, then you take those other choices. Um, it's sad to say they get hundreds of billions of dollars, but most of us have had bad experiences at the VA. And a lot of people live in small town in rural America, and they are hours away from a VA facility if it even has a program. So our country is not set up well to serve those men and women who are going to have problems with post-traumatic stress disorder in the future. That's an excellent question. And um, if you're not a conspiracist theory, then you can just attribute it to ignorance and indifference. They are using our men and women. And today's military has a great deal more women than it had in decades past. And they have had a difficult time of their own with military sexual trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. There is a film that was banned for 30 years, shot by John Huston, Let There Be Light. It would, it's take, it, it takes place during World War II. And during that film, <clears throat> it depicted young veterans coming home from World War II and being debriefed for two weeks. And you saw the changes that were affected in these men over that period of time. People with tremors, people that were disconnected, people that were fearful, slowly decompressing. Now, I've met a couple of Medal of Honor recipients in recent years, and you know that those people who get the Blue Max walk on water. And I'm told that one of the um, recipients was sent by his commanding officer immediately after that action to talk to somebody. He was clear. Now that's a CO that was taking responsibility for his people, for his troops. Uh, I don't know how standard that is, but we, the information is there. We had techniques 60 years ago, 70 years ago, that served our soldiers coming home from World War II. Why we're not using them today after Iraq and Afghanistan, I couldn't tell you. But it's just one of a, a rather long and disgusting list of shortcomings. Uh, and, um, well, let's not characterize it. Let's say that a lot of work needs to be done. So we're dealing with this character, this prince, who is in the bars all the time. He's the heir apparent. And, and the king, his father, is very upset. He's never at court. And so he just thinks he's a slacker, right? And 
there's a moment when uh, he's alone, it's a soliloquy, a private moment, where he goes, yeah, 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 I'm doing what I can while I can. Because come the day, I am so going to outshine everybody and surprise everybody. Um, so there's a, there's a debate as to whether he's just saying that and he truly is a slacker or he truly believes that mm -hmm. um, and has some understanding of what is to come and, and knows that once that time comes, he's not going to have the opportunity to be a boy. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're playing with the idea of, one of the things we're playing with is the idea of growing up. What are those moments when you grow up? So I want to ask you to think, uh, to just share a moment for yourself that, that had to do with, with, you know, you're younger, you're growing up, and suddenly you realize, oh. We're not in Kansas anymore. Correct, correct. I think every soldier in combat has that moment of truth. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, I wrote, um, one of the chapters in my book is called um, The Boot. I was on one of my first missions, and uh, we were doing a sweep through Rice Paddy, and I came upon a jungle boot, and I thought, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote, I, I had this immediate rush to judgment, how careless, the troopers left this boot out here, and, and I leaned over and I could see this jagged shin bone from his rotting foot sticking up, and uh, it touched me in a way that nothing before or since touched me. Uh, no body, no death ever affected me as much as that. This was, this was um, my baptism. It wasn't about being shot at or shooting people. It was the detritus of combat. This is real. Uh, there are consequences, and this is what it looks like when your day doesn't go well. One final thought for you. So as a kid, what kind of toys did you like to play with? I played cowboys and Indians. I didn't play Audie Murphy or John Wayne games. Um, you know, I was born during a time when the Army had just barely been segregated, and I lived through civil rights. Uh, my sixth grade was uh, the first grade I went to in an integrated school in Washington, D.C. But uh, I had a, a, a Daisy Red Rider carbine, and I was a dead shot even then as a kid. And I remember killing my first bird and not really feeling that good about it, you know. I was proud of the shot, but when I, you know, um, even as a kid, I realized, you know, it's really, did you need to do this? Uh, it, it was a, it was a, a real eye-opener. But uh, I played sports, but I wasn't a gang kid. I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't, and in those days, you could get away with hitting somebody, you know, and nobody was running around with Glocks and Uzis. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, I was a city kid who fell in love with soldiering. I was just really good at it, and I liked the physical challenge. And my father had pulled strings and arranged. I was a TV director for NBC when I was drafted. I was out of college. And he had arranged for me to be stationed with the Army's information uh, area, the, the, the big picture. They, we made films, training, you know, training films, propagandistic films, whatnot. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to lead men in battle. I had read about war all of my life. I had read Henry. I had read the Iliad. I wanted to know what it was, and I wanted to know if I could measure up. And uh, no one could dissuade me. What advice would you give someone considering joining or about to begin basic training or, you know, being drafted? Be as clear as you can be about what you're getting into. Be clear about the consequences. Be clear that if you volunteer and take that oath, then you may have to deploy to a place where 
combat is going on. You may risk your life. You may lose your life or your limbs or your ability to live as you know it. Be sure you know what you're getting into. Be sure this is what you want to do. I understand it's a way for kids to get money for college. It's a place where you can mature and grow up in a hurry. But um, don't, don't buy into all the movies you see. Don't buy into all the TV shows. Watching TV shows and movies about war are like watching pornography. It has nothing to do with sexuality. It's just what it looks like.